let me introduce our um, speakers tonight. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Emily Christiansen and Dr. Amber Danton, who are both assistant lecturers at the Courtauld, where they both did their PhDs, as did I. <laughs> Emily's uh, focused on the Orient in the work of Vasily Kandinsky. She's recently contributed to an exhibition at the Kunsthaus in Zurich, exploring the reception of Islamic art in Europe from the mid-19th century to today. Amber's PhD focused on surrealism in the Levant, and she is now a research associate at the Warburg Institute in London. Um, the, what they're going to be talking about today is an exhibition that they have curated, which is still on at the Courtauld Gallery, um, which is called uh, Drawing on Arabian Nights, which is a display of 13 works on paper, um, and really thinking about why these works can be described as Orientalist, what that term actually means, and how um, these work can be re related to contemporaneous translations of the stories known to us today as the Arabian Nights. So let's, uh, I'm going to ask the first question, which is really, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the exhibition and why you set the works in the context of the popularity uh, in the Victorian era of the Arabian Nights? Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Nicola, and hello, everybody. Um, we, uh, the exhibition really started about two years ago. Amber and I teach a course on Orientalism at the Courtauld. And as we were preparing it, we decided we wanted to investigate what works the Courtauld had in its collection that were Orientalist. And these were, um, it's, a, it's a genre of art that isn't normally associated with the Courtauld. So we really didn't know what to expect. And we found, in fact, dozens of works on paper of which the works, the 13 works in our exhibition were our favorites. Um, and Amber is just going to show a few of them now while, while I'm talking. Um, so some of these works have never been shown to the public before. And when we had the idea of presenting them as, in, uh, as a group in an exhibition, we were very concerned with how to do it in a way that conveyed the complexity of the works. And the complexity of these works is something that doesn't appear at first glance. And so it was something that we really had to, um, to think hard about and think about how we could structure uh, the exhibition in a way that, that kind of engaged with that. Um, when, just to kind of make sure everyone's on the, same page when we talk about orientalist art what we what we're referring to is art that was produced mainly by european artists during the 19th and 20th centuries which has historically been understood to show accurate depictions of life and people in north africa and the middle east which was a region that was just referred to kind of generically as the orient and Amber will talk a little bit more about kind of the assumptions around the term. Um, and the, the interpretation that these are very straightforward, accurate depictions is encouraged by the high degree of, um, of naturalism and lifelikeness in, within this genre of art that you can see in these works. And what we're trying to convey is that because these are works that were produced during you know, the expansion of European colonial empires at a time when um, artists were beginning to travel, but a lot of the public was not. Um, we're trying to convey the complexities which don't appear automatically when you look at the works um, and to convey the idea that these works are as much about European preconceptions and preoccupations as they are about any reality that the artists observed when traveling in the region, if they did ever travel to the region. Um, and this one is a perfect example, this John Frederick Lewis of, you know, it's this very lifelike sketch and watercolor of drawing and watercolor of a man in a burnous. It looks, you know, like it from, 
at, at a very kind of superficial level. It looks like it could be an ethnographic drawing of a man in, uh, in North African dress. In fact, what it shows is likely Lewis himself dressed in different, a kind of pastiche of different elements of North African and Gulf Arab dress that he's combined together. So the North African white burnous and the Gulf Arab head rope, which wouldn't normally ever be put together in a single, uh, a single outfit. So what we're trying to show with this exhibition is that these, you know, exquisite, beautifully rendered works are much more complex than they first than they first appear. And while they look entirely realistic, what they show us is not necessarily real. And so, and we chose the framework of Arabian Nights because it allows us to explore the idea that these are works that are in fact conflations of literary fictions and observed reality. So, and I think Ambra wants to talk a bit more about the Arabian Nights aspect of it. Just, oh, you're, you're muted, Nicola. I didn't hear you. <laughs> No, that's exactly what I was going to ask you, was was if you could tell us a little bit more about the Arabian Nights, yeah. Absolutely, and uh, thanks everybody for, for being here. I'll just go through the fact that, I should preface by saying that we were very aware that Arabian Nights is not the only text that plays a part in creating Orientalist images, and I know that we haven't, you know, defined Orientalism very much as, uh, yet, but we will soon. But what we found out when we um, approached the Courtauld collection and looked through it with this particular eye was that some of the works specifically mentioned this text, which prompted us to, to look into it a little bit more. And considering the popularity of the text and its diffusion across Europe, it became a very productive way to think about image making through reading of a text that is specifically fictional. But, um, it's not straightforwardly fictional, or at least not for everybody, um, because some of the works that we found uh, in a way challenged that. So um, what I'm showing right now is a portrait of one of the most popular, famous um, translators of Arabian Nights, a text that has been translated by many people um, across many decades and different iterations. Uh, Edward Lane was an Ottomanist um, a scholar who lived in Cairo for a number of years and uh, wrote treatises on life in Ottoman Egypt in the 19th century. But um, his own translation of Arabian Nights into English is something of a conflation of you know, the fictional aspects of the text and the pretense of scientificity as he uh, annotates it copiously and makes it into a sort of pseudo-scientific treatise of life in Ottoman Egypt. And here we see him portrayed as if he is an Ottoman. So the, um, the idea is that the identity of, of Egypt has seeped into his own, um, and he's presented as a sort of interpreter of the region. Uh, we also display in the exhibition um, the book itself, we display a, a version of it from uh, the Victorian era that was specifically, it was interesting because every version um, is adapted to the audience that will read it. So in this case, we have a version that is adapted for a young, a young audience. And so the most erotic scenes have been censored. And for us um, displaying this image, for instance, which is from the book, but that is in the Courtauld collection as a, um, a wall uh, image, as if it was a painting, uh, led us to think about the role of illustrations in the text and the fact that artists were invited to um, illustrate Arabian Nights with their own renderings of the scenes. So thinking about what is the genre of Arabian Nights, what liberties, what freedoms, uh, what conceits are artists coming up with to display, to, to, to illustrate this text? And how do the images complement, maybe even enrich the text rather than just accompany it? 
And I think my favorite from this section of the exhibition is the Holman Hunt pair of engravings after Holman Hunt, actually. Um, uh, I think these are, if you see the exhibition, these will appear to you to be rather mute. They're very small, they're black and white, uh, certainly not as grandiose as other images in, in, in the show, but they encapsulate what we really wanted to capture in the show, which is the layers of meaning. In this case, Holman Hunt, he did travel to the Middle East, uh, to Palestine and to Egypt and to Syria a number of times. But the images that we see here, he created after reading a poem by Tennyson. Tennyson, uh, the poem is Recollections of, Ara of, of the Arabian Nights. And the poem itself was not written after an experience in the region, but was written after reading Arabian Nights. So we have an image written about a poem that is written about a text. Um, this multi multiple layering of meaning and of intertextual relationships was really what encapsulates our approach to these images that we think should be approached with more skepticism about what is presented on the surface. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being polite. I don't want to interrupt you. So I mean, oh, no. then I forget to unmute. <laughs> um, one thing I just wondered if you might say a little bit about is the sort of, I know we don't want to get into a heavy theoretical discussion, but I think it would be interesting to know why scholars have been so interested in the concept of Orientalism for, you know, two or three decades now, um, since the famous book by Edward Said, if you could just maybe just very briefly outline why should we, you know, why have we been worried about Orientalism and, you know, we can talk later about the future of it, whether it's still a valid term, but but just to define it for us a little bit. Absolutely. I'm I'm flicking through images in the meantime just to give a just to give a sense of what we've been looking at. Um so I suppose the first thing one should do when thinking about what Orientalism is, is to establish what the term actually means historically. So before Orientalism became a dirty word um, in, in Said's account, and uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I'll, I'll define it in a second. Orientalism was actually a, an academic discipline um, that students took up when they wanted to learn the language, the customs, the literature, the philosophy, of anything relating to the world, probably of what we may think of as the Islamic world today. Obviously, this is a very fraught term now, but uh, but you know what I mean. Uh, so it was an academic discipline first. Then we have the um, emergence of what is a, an artistic genre. So of artists depicting maybe what they what they see what they read about what they uh, hear about about this region that becomes more than just physical observation of people and places it becomes a real genres with stereotypes and tropes and and visual compositions that people begin to recognize so see here uh, we have lewis uh, depicting an interior and then reutilizing it in his depictions of harem when he's back in London. So a real genre of genre of painting that sells really well. And then in the seventies, um, Orientalism becomes um, a critical a critical theory term. Uh, Edward Said writes the eponymous book Orientalism, and he it's a very it's a change in the way that we think about Orientalism because he defines it as no longer something that pertains to the region of Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, North Africa, but as something that speaks more to what Europeans are experiencing in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, this art does not accurately depict what it feels like, what it means to live in this region. It more so depicts the anxieties, the desires of Europeans who are in this region, colonizers, adventurers, explorers, uh, and so on and so forth. So it becomes a word that in encapsulates an experience of modernity, but not one that necessarily pertains to this region. And in fact, it can even do damage to this region 
by means of these visual stereotypes where this orient is depicted as timeless, as without work, as um, lascivious. And um, for example, the image of the odalisk is um, very important in this because it's such an important trope in art um, that extends to thinking about social norms in this region, but that has actually no relationship whatsoever to the reality of this region. Um, so we have a we have an incredibly um, long lasting visual trope uh, of the harem of the odalisk in the harem, but you would never see this um, these women or these kind of scenes in in the region so that's in a nutshell what yeah. orientalism means <laughs> that's really helpful and was it was it purely a western phenomenon i mean was it was it just the vision of these mainly men and but i think there were also some women that went to the orient to paint these things i'll, I'll speak again and then I'll, I'll shut up for a bit but um the the quick answer is no um and this is something that scholars are still in the process of trying to decode, but uh, very famous artists, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, thinking of Osman Hamdi Bey, who has been extremely renowned in the past few years and extremely commercially successful in, for example, auction houses, he spends a number of years in the early 20th century uh, painting extremely orientalist pictures, and scholars are still trying to decide why he did that. Um, arguably, his Orientalist pictures are not the same as European Orientalism in the sense that whereas Europeans might depict men smoking the hookah pipe or lounging in the sun or just you know playing at leisure, Osman Hamdi Bey, an Ottoman polymath, a museum director, an academic, he depicts them intellectually engaged, uh, perhaps in um, a theological conversation, reading the Quran, or in religious spaces, um, thinking. Uh, he depicts women not lounging semi-naked and sexually available, but also as reading, thinking agents, uh, perhaps even engaged in mundane activities like hanging in the laundry. Uh, so there's a real perceivable difference in how he uses the language of Orientalism, but at the same time, he employs it, although some of his contemporaries conceived it as a very damaging visual uh, vocabulary. And he does it, and scholars are not quite sure why, because he didn't really write about his practice. We think it may be because of commercial viability of this genre, it makes a lot of money, and it's specifically targeted at European audiences. Um, and by the same European audiences, he is perceived as a very authentic Orientalist uh, who has the lay of the land. He understands the light. He understands the landscape. So he's privileged in, in, in using this vocabulary. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely not just a Western phenomenon, um, even in the 19th century. Emily, do you want to come back in? And you... Yes, I was just going to to add what's fascinating is how uh, contemporary artists now, particularly women from the region, have re-engaged with Orientalism mm -hmm. um, and with some of its themes and tropes. I mean, in the, in the exhibition, we include a work by Yasmin Seal, who is the translator. She's a, a British Syrian poet who's a translator of the Arabian Nights and in fact is the only woman to have translated it into English. Um, it's a very recent translation from just uh, 2021. Um, and she produced a series of kind of responses to Arabian Nights that she called erasures that, that are really, um, they're really visual poems uh, that she produces using torn out pages of Edward Lane's earlier translation of Arabian Nights. And she uses the words on the page to create new both visual images and uh, mini poems that reflect and respond to 
the, the stories of Arabian Nights. But there are other artists as well, like the photographer Lala Asaidi, who uh, works with some of the visual tropes of Orientalism, specifically the odalisk in the harem with the you know very decorative tile backdrops, um, but who's reclaiming it and working with you know these images in a completely new and different way. So it's interesting how um, Orientalism seems to have a continued re relevance as uh, a way of establishing and discussing the complexity of identity now. That's that's very, very interesting. But the, And there's also, as I understand it, I mean, there's also still quite a strong market for Orientalist paintings, particularly in the Middle East, isn't there? Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um, yeah, so, I mean, interestingly, Sotheby's holds an annual specialist auction that focuses just on Orientalism. And in fact, it was only about two weeks ago, and Amber and I were there. Um, and it's, you know, they, every year, they've been quite substantial collections that are offered for sale. And, and, and they include also some contemporary works, but the majority of the the works on display are the 19th century european orientalist art and what what we've discovered is that throughout particularly the 21st century the strongest market for the art has been in the middle east particularly in the gulf there are some very large collections of orientalist art in the gulf um and also in uh, Southeast Asian Islamic countries. So there's a an extensive collection in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia as well. Um, and some research has been done on uh, the, what it means for this art that was produced as a representation by Europeans of a region, what it means for the art to kind of return to the region and be owned and viewed and collected by people from the region. And it's quite, it's, it's you know, one of the things that we find fascinating about this material, it adds yet another layer and another potential meaning um, to the already kind of multiple meanings that, that these works might have in their, you know, original context, their post-colonial context, and now this kind of, this new post-post-colonial context. Um, and so the scholar Nadia Radwan, for example, has talked about how um, the collections, certainly the collections that are publicly exhibited or published within this context, so particularly the, in the Gulf states, they tend to prioritize different subgenres within Orientalism. And that gives it, that it, it gives a different meaning to, to the works. So for example, she's highlighted that they tend to uh, prioritize images of, um, of scholars, imams, um, uh, of men who are working uh, in and uh, uh, traders, uh, men in marketplaces who are being productive and you know, actively participating in the life and the commerce of the region. And that these taken together establish new ideas about, uh, about heritage and identity, really. Um, so they're being used to construct uh, new ideas about, uh, about heritage and identity. And, and, and some of the other genres, like the harem scenes, tend to be excluded from these collections for, you know, perhaps for obvious reasons, that they are much more uh, remote, they're much more fantastical. And yet that's what we see often in mm. museums here. Although yeah. I think museums are becoming, I mean, some museums, they just hang them, don't they? And they don't comment on them. I suspect that's going to become more problematic with people now wanting a bit more of a kind of reckoning, you know, what what 
what is on the walls of your museum how did it get there you know what what does it mean for the for yeah. it to be there it's although interestingly i think there are um there are cultural differences in the way countries deal with it um so i think there is more of a willingness to reckon with it here in the uk than there is for example in france um uh, this might be a, a vast overstatement but certainly our our experience of going to exhibitions and uh, exhibits within permanent collections of orientalism it tends to be exhibited as um uncomplicated portrayals of life in the middle east and the any kind of uh indication that there has been a discussion and you know the entire uh development of post-colonial thinking and the application of that to these works is completely ignored certainly in the cases uh that we saw i'm just going to ask you one more question because i think we've got to the point where it'd be nice if people have their own questions but have there actually been any exhibitions in the west of orientalism recently which have actually taken these problematic objects and actually re-examine them and this is something i'm particularly interested in because you know this is something that we did recently at the henry moore institute in leeds was take sculptures of you know that were very problematic from the 19th century and look at them again and think about you know why they were produced and what you know what what were the sort of discourses behind them and 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 it was actually very um and people received it very well you know it had a very mm -hmm. diverse audience people really liked it people weren't offended by it, I don't think. They really, they really wanted to discuss them again and to think about them again. So I'm just wondering whether this has happened in I can't think of any exhibitions like this, but but maybe I'm just being being dim. No, I I don't think there has been anything. I mean Emily, do you want to jump in? I was just going to say the one example was the uh, the exhibition at the Musée d'Orsay. So this is the exception to the rule of what I was saying, slandering all French um, exhibitions. But their, the ex their exhibition, The Black Model, um, which wasn't just Orientalism, but it featured some Orientalism, that was very much about re-engaging with questions of uh, race and identity within these works and looking at them from the perspective of works that were created during a colonial period and in a time when there were, you know, um, racial hierarchies that were that were taken for granted. Um, but I think, by and large, it it tends to be something that what we've noticed is that exhibitions tend to have a small information panel where they raise the issues up front at the start of the exhibition but then just go on to celebrate the works and look at them in quite an uncomplicated hang them in quite an uncomplicated manner and this was something that Umber and I were very focused on with our exhibition and you know we don't know if if we got the balance right but we were very determined to present them consistently throughout the exhibition, I mean, small exhibition, but throughout in every single case as complicated works that have, although we weren't, we deliberately shied away from using terms like post-colonialism, but because we we presented them using the kind of applying post-colonial theory, saying that they were influenced by fiction as much as they were by observed reality, we tried to sustain that throughout the exhibition. So it was it was our kind of opportunity to experiment with that. And it's something that we've been reflecting on um, since. Congratulations. I mean, I thought it was a I thought it is a great exhibition. And any anybody who hasn't seen it yet, it's on for another another week, 10 days. 10 days, um, yeah. So yeah. I hope you do something else. You know, go and Get the Wallace collection, for example, to do something, you know, that would be great. <laughs> that would be very exciting. Yes. <laughs>